Welcome at the Growcast, the podcast of Blue City and Blue City Lab, in which we talk with eight Rotterdam-based pioneering bio designers, our so-called pioneers, about how a future will look like if we design with nature as our guideline. We started this podcast to celebrate the opening of Blue City Lab, a biocircular playground for pioneers located in the heart of Blue City. We invited four frontrunners whose work will make us rethink everything we think we know and four aspiring bio designers who want to challenge the status quo. My name is Barbara Vos and I'm Emma van der Leest. In today's podcast, I'm very, very proud to welcome award-winning biodesigner, founder of Blue City Lab, biodesign visionary, and my co-host of this podcast, Emma van der Leest. Welcome, Emma. Thank you, Barbara, for the introduction. <laughs> so it's it's a bit <laughs> strange because, um, well, uh, for the people at home who will listen to this podcast chronologically, um, Emma is my co-host, and we are presenting this podcast together, but today you are the one I'm going to interview. Yeah, very excited. But when I was working uh, the plan out for this podcast, because then you have to write a script and, 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 and well, create some sort of a blueprint, it made so much sense to me to ask you as the actual host of this podcast, because you literally brief the Blue City Lab vibes as every part of your DNA is to see collaboration and to work together with microorganisms and waste streams. And also because you know all of the people here. It's like this, uh, you're connected to everyone and you're the inspiration to many of those. And um, I'm really happy to put them on a stage this week. Well, some of them, but we have more people, of course, who are really good and uh, which you can check out on uh, on the website, of course. Yeah, and it's also because uh, for us here at Blue City, you started this bio uh, bio designers wave actually so um before we go to the question we ask all of our uh, interviewees but could you tell us because we are focusing on bio designers but what is a bio designer well i'm i'm not the person who coined the term bio design i think william myers the writer uh white writer curator uh of the book bio design uh, wrote a very beautiful um, essay about this, but uh, from my perspective, a bio designer um, embodies an emerging design movement, which incorporates the use of living materials uh, made with, uh, for example, fungi, algae, uh, yeast, but also culture tissue and bacteria. And bio design can be part of a more of a standard crafting method uh, that we all know, or uh, more of the complex fields of, for example, biomimicry and synthetic biology. And designers can use these organisms, for example, as a as a toolkit, as an inspiration or as a building block. And you can literally build materials with microorganisms, which we have seen uh, and will see and listen to mm -hmm. in the coming uh, podcasts. And you can literally create a product whose properties are enhanced as a result of uh, the use of these living materials. So every organism has specific properties we can include in materials. And that is really interesting. It's a really, really big field. And actually it came from the medicine medicine technologies. Oh, wow. It emerged out of that, I think. Because if we think about biodesign, for example, if we ask our uh, second guest of today what biodesign is, probably his perspective will be different than... Than yeah, mine. because you brought someone along, right? So we're going to yeah. introduce him later, but yes, maybe you can give a little bit of a teaser. Yeah, Hein van der Lee, he's from the Rappout University, and I collaborated with him and his colleagues. How does biodesign reflect on the circular economy? How is it connected? Well, it is um, inevitable to include this, because we are working with nature, we look at circular systems, nature works as a circular system, as an ecosystem. Um, and I think um, we can also include the use of microorganisms or, for example, enzymes into a circular design. So it is interconnected with each other. It's, it can be an addition. It's not only working with waste streams, but we also have people here in the building who use specific um, enzymes or bacteria um, with and uh, combine that sorry, with a waste stream to create a new product. So there are, um, yeah, it is part of it. 
Oh, full stop. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so how were the last couple of months for you in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic? Well, um, personally, it was, it was okay. The projects were cancelled and that's part of my income. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it was um, quite difficult. And a lot of people also said to me, oh, why don't you go uh, grow some uh, mouth masks <laughs> out of... Uh, fungi, for example, uh, I heard that a lot and I decided not to do um, so because I think, yeah, it's a kind of statement and uh, also a choice that I made for myself just to focus uh, and uh, work on a project that we're already running and not to do side steps. And besides that, I need a laboratory to yeah. <laughs> create something like that. Of course, the home is also always a kind of base, um, but yeah. It's, uh, I decided not to do that and uh, getting attraction from the media to, to create things like this. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I survived. And well, that's good to hear. I'm very happy to hear as well as you as my co-host. But you told me that you got some concerned people asking you uh, questions about the lab, right? Because of um, the COVID crisis and how it emerged out of nowhere. Uh, could you tell something about that? There's a little anecdote, and that's uh, yeah. for, to explain how people think about working with living materials. Yeah, I posted a, um, a picture of the microbial vending machine on Instagram, and there was a concerned person who said, oh, are you also growing viruses? Yeah. <laughs> and what is a virus, actually? But it's, it's nothing like a bacteria. It's a piece of uh, it's a genetic thing. Um, but, yeah, people s start to think more and more about, of course, the virus and what it is exactly. Um, so I explained to her what, what the, uh, the virus is, of course, um, or from my perspective, and I uh, referred to the website of the REVM. Uh, very, good, very trustworthy. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, and also virologist Marion Koopman said in the beginning, I remember uh, her saying on TV that the, the, the Netherlands have 17 million virologists now. Yeah. In the Netherlands, because everybody have apparently an opinion about this and know always know better than the scientists. Let's go to the first question. So, can you tell us how nature inspires your work? Well, it always uh, inspired me a lot. I grew up uh, at the Veluwe with a lot of forests and. Um, yeah, as a kid, I always liked to play outside. I was always interested in fungi. For example, as a kid, I, of course, did new, actually, uh, besides eating them, uh, all the ones from the supermarket then, what it was or what you can do with it. Um, and yeah, I got very much inspired in this field because I saw a jacket in the Boymans van Beuningen Museum here in Rotterdam that was grown by bacteria in yeast. And it was designed by Suzanne Lee, who I eventually yep. interned with. And I thought, wow, if design, <laughs> if this is also a, a, a prime example of nature, uh, that bacteria and yeast are able to grow a leather-like material in the fat of liquid, that changed my perception. Yep. So nature is always, is always the best designer because we can find solutions um, for basically every problem, I think. Um, but we can also... Um, grow them or nurture them, them in a way that it, they could be beneficial for us as a human, without yeah. a human-centered perspective. <laughs> um, but yeah. yeah, because it's, it's, it's really interesting, because you just mentioned Susan Lee, uh, she took you under her wings for a, a couple of years ago, I think, but she's now this, this rock star, bio designer, uh, rocking the stage in the fashion industry. You were talking about seeing that jacket in a museum like 10 years ago, and now she's working with these renowned big brands, and that. Uh, so for me, that's really interesting. That what's happening in these in the basement here in Blue City Lab, it's actually becoming mainstream. Yeah, and I'm really happy with that because brands really um, rethink their their own brands and know that they have to change because we can't continue in the way we are doing right now, especially in the fashion industry, there are a, a lot of things need to be changed over there. 
And we've seen designers like um, Stella McCartney working with um, silks that are grown by yeast in big fermentation tanks. Yeah, she's she's big for people who don't know her. Yeah, she's, she's very really big. she's <laughs> very big. So I'm really happy. Also, brands like Adidas have been working with companies, uh, the North Face. Um, so we see companies starting working on this. But of, of course, it's a very limited yeah. um, amount of products and to make it uh, accessible for everyone, us, uh, your neighbor, for example, mm -hmm. there is a lot of things that need to be worked on uh, to implement it in such a big system. Yeah, because, yeah, let's get back to that system and back to you, because what interested you in working with these living organisms? Well, I think that we can basically produce every material from a textile to a composite to a concrete out of for example, bacteria or yeast, living materials. Uh, the science is um, a very powerful uh, tool uh, to create it and also grow it very efficiently. Um, and of course, for example, I'm, look, I'm sitting at a wooden table. We can now ferment and grow tissues, um, not to wipe your tears, but a, a human tissue. So for some skin, yeah. we can grow in a, a liquid way. So we don't need to slaughter um, cows, for example, and for loss, leather. Yeah. So we are able to, um, to do this in laboratories already. Um, so that's a very big thing, which is very far away. It sounds yeah. like science fiction, maybe, to, to some of you, but <laughs> it, it is will, happening. Yeah. yeah, yeah. we'll talk later about the implementation on what's yeah. needed to get there. But that that's, gives us a lot of hope um, that, that this already can be done. So how do you observe nature and translate the aspects of it in your design? Well, literally observing. So last year I was literally hunting for ink cap mushrooms in the forest because I was working with, a, we were working with a certain it's, it's species. It's called foraging, right? Yeah, but I was, I think, three or four days too late. So the, the ink caps were already, um, yeah, uh, well, not in their full. Um, yeah, so, uh, but... It, that's a way how I um, find my inspiration mm -hmm. and also observe it at home. So I picked some uh, mushrooms, which is obviously not allowed, but I brought my uh, card from the Radboud University, my, my guest uh, card to show, you know, this is for scientific purposes. Um, but also I try to, to read a lot and not only about nature, but also... Um, more the philosophical side and um, yeah, what we already have learned about nature. So I was also working with a colleague on a timeline of scientific breakthroughs uh, from more than 300 years ago. And that also learned me a lot and gave me new perspectives on how we perceive nature nowadays. Yeah. Um, and also, for example, a really nice fact that um, um, the first microscope or kind of the improved microscope by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek um, brought the insight that, you know, he was not a scientist. He was uh, a person that was checking uh, cotton coming from the East and uh, was checking the quality of it with a lens. Yeah. And he was so uh, agitated by the fact that this lens was from such a bad quality that he decided to improve the lenses. And he was the one who kind of stapled lenses in a kind of tube yeah. to magnify the cotton. And that's how he kind of reinvented this microscope without knowing. And he was observing a lot of things. And then he found out that, you know, how fleas are working and mites. And he was uh, keeping dirty socks in, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, in a cupboard to observe how, how bacteria and things are growing. Do you see that it's actually changing? how we touch people, see nature, and work with nature throughout the years. Yeah, I think so. And I've seen a program last week, I can't remember if it was the news, but that uh, during the first lockdown, a lot of people start to have walks in the forest again, or on yeah. the beach, and literally opened their eyes and thought, oh, wow, this is, this is actually a tree, and this is a meadow, and this is a flower. And really remember them 
to the days that they walked with there with their parents when they mm -hmm. were little. So a lot of people start to revalue nature, especially if you can't go to a cinema or anything yeah. else. So you go to the forest and see, but that's also... Reconnect with nature. Reconnect with nature. No, but what, what's also interesting is like people are indeed reconnecting with nature and becoming a plague for nature as well because they keep on littering everywhere. So the boswachters, um, the guardians of the forest. Foresters, right? Foresters. Yeah. They are um, uh, actually uh, are now alarming like everyone. So please, okay, come, but keep your litter with you, you know, we don't have all the commodities you have in urban society, yeah. it's nature. So that's interesting. But next to that, yeah. I think in the last five years, a lot of people became more aware of of sustainability in yeah. general, also with the climate goals we have on the European level or a worldwide level, uh, more and more people start to look at their own lives and see where can I improve, where can I start, but also yeah. in companies and It is a big challenge, but I think uh, starting with yourself and your surroundings and try to rethink what you might can do differently uh, yeah. in your life to uh, adapt. You, of course, are the founder and creative brain uh, behind Blue City Lab. But, um, so I want to ask you why you started this lab, but also... So let's start with that question. So why you started the lab and then afterwards have you seen things change? Yeah, I started the lab out of a frustration. <laughs> um, while studying at the art school here, the Willem de Kooning, um, I was interested in, for example, Suzanne's work, and I literally started to grow things in my student dorm uh, <laughs> and in the, the kitchen over there. Uh, and, of course, I came to the conclusion that a lab would be more sufficient. <laughs> so uh, by the time I had to choose uh, a minor, I picked a minor not at the Willem de Kooning, but uh, first I tried the TU Delft, but yeah. I got refused because uh, my uh, mathematics is not uh, very well. So, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, attend uh, a material science department over there, which I was really looking for. But I uh, picked a minor at the industrial design uh, studies from the University of Rotterdam. And in the same building, the biology and chemistry department, I would like to collaborate with the students from the biology department, if possible. Yeah. And they never really thought about that. And uh, But there was one person who actually took me by the hand, Erik Kamst, back then. Um, and he said, well... I find it interesting, so I can show you what is your idea. Uh, so the idea was to develop a packaging from mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, and we were working with a city farm, Eigenstadt, which is not uh, there anymore, but uh, to use um, hemp sheets that were on their, in their aquaponics system and create packaging for the mushrooms that they were also growing there out of those sheets. And we needed a lab for that. Because I was also working with two other students. It caused a lot of uh, friction because we were literally, um, well, people were laughing at us. Yeah. And uh, they said, well, you're not trained. Um, but we said, yeah, we read. People really didn't understand why you no, wanted the lab or no. wanted to use a lab. No, and didn't sort of value of it. And I said, I really want to work with the students and see what yeah. they think about it. And um, so that, that was, eventually we, we got access Yeah. under supervision, of course, and they gave us the compliment that we worked more neat than their own students. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, that's good. Yeah. But that was a really, really big struggle. And I also went back to London for my graduation project because it was really hard to get coaching from student, well, from, from tutors here who don't have a background in biology. Yeah. Um, and after I graduated with a project would, which was about uh, the change... Um, of the product design, or the, yeah, if you want to collaborate with science, being a product designer, how does that work? Yeah. And I thought, this is, this needs to change. So I came up with this idea. With this, the, the Blue City Lab? With well, Blue City Lab, or starting a laboratory somewhere. Yeah, so you've, you found the, the founders of Blue City, and then you said, let's start this laboratory. How did well, it go? yeah, they saw they uh, yeah, Marcus Seymour from Holters Rom for yeah, at so, a conference. So they are uh, uh, two of the co-founders of uh, Blue City. Yes, and they uh, saw a presentation 
uh, of my graduation work where I pitched the idea for a laboratory, like, for example, the Waag Society in, in Amsterdam. Yep. Um, and uh, after that, I was talking with them and they said, well, this building is recently bought. Do you want to come by to talk about this? Uh, so I said, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think I want to introduce our, our second guest because um, we want to talk about how important it is to work together with scientists. And I'm so very honored and very proud to introduce a special guest to the table. He was sitting here already, but now joining the conversation. He has worked for 24 years as a mycological technician in the clinical mycology department of the Radboud University in Nijmegen. And he has given international lectures and courses for many years so that everyone becomes aware of the dangers of medical important fungi. And he's a member of the International Society for Human and Animal Mycology Working Group for Education. Welcome, Hein van der Leer. Thank you. Um, just to be sure, mycology, we're talking about fungus, right? Yes. Mycology is more like uh, not only mold, but also the, the, the yeasts and also the products of the, the molds and the yeasts. So that's the reason mycology is confirming everything. Okay, and can, can, can you give us some examples of these products? Because the right a range of products, you can imagine? Uh, yes. In medical mycology, we have, I think, 6,000 strains who are uh, oh. able to infect the human. And if you know, there's one and a half million kind of fungi you know, there's not that much who are able to get infections. But if you don't know which one can give infection, then you have a problem. So yeah. if you start working with a mold, like Emma, <laughs> she has to be known if it's maybe toxic or maybe infective for human people or animals. Uh, we met uh, Emma. Uh, Emma was uh, had a pitch with Paul Verwey and was on a on a, it was a, a, <laughs> a sort of kind of a date. Yeah, <laughs> yes, a, no, I, a date, no, well, no, kind no, of. No, uh, no, it was <laughs> yeah, I was participating together with Anita Schaap Ozim uh, back then in uh, the Bio Art and Design Award. Uh, mm -hmm. And we got successfully matched to Dr. Paul Verwey, who was uh, working with Hein um, to help us develop 100% uh, natural coating derived from a fungus. Uh, and so that's uh, how we ended up working for four months uh, at, together with the Rabat University mm -hmm. to develop a kind of proof of concept, which is, of course, very short uh, to develop. And Hein was one of our uh, uh, yeah, colleagues in the lab. He helped us out with a lot of things. Um, so that's, that's how we met. Mm -hmm. so, and, we, and we just heard that it's not very common, right, to work together with designers back in those days. Or was it for you? No, I think it's common. Is it? Yes, I think. Um, but not, not, not on leather materials, but in biological uh, materials, yes. I think it's common. Because uh, we, only, we always think in 2D structure, structures, and mm -hmm. the human body is a 3D structure. So we have to think always on another side. And that's difficult. We work on a plate. Yeah. Uh, the fungus is growing on a plate. But how you can manage it or something else, everything is in 2D structure. Yeah. So you have to build it up to a 3D, uh, 3D structure. And that's when we knock at the door at the bio, uh, the bio designers. And, has, and, and that has always been the case? Or? No, 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 no. It's not always been the case because uh, medical and the university is always their own area exactly yeah and they are always afraid for in introducing some other areas inside their own area it's it's uh, very precarious of of course to work in the medical area as well yes. yeah. yeah you have to be careful yes but if even when you work with fungi or yeah. with molds uh, if you go to another department and to say i need some equipment you're not allowed because everybody is afraid of mold yeah, and, and, and can you tell us something about how the collaboration started on uh, with you two on a specific project? Yes, first was the choice of uh, uh, the mold who has the properties to, to give uh, uh, the coating. And mm -hmm. that was the first thing what we did. 
And yeah, then so we it's started basically to, like yeah, speed dating. Yes, that wasn't yeah. speeding dating because, day. Because this was for the 100% natural water repellent coating, right? So, uh, but the difficulty is um, that there are slow growing molds and how you can expand them and how you can stimulate them to grow earlier or faster. And that was what I did with, uh, with Emma. So why is fungi so special? What makes it so special for you to work with? You walk in the, in the forest. I do. Yes, yeah, so and you see all the mushrooms and you see all the kind of paddenstoelen uh, in Dutch. And I think they are amazing. Really, they are amazing. And I think when you're going back to the bacteriology of the microbiology lab and everybody, we now have a lot of machines who, who do our work. Yeah. Only for the mycology, it's impossible. Because we are, I think, one of the oldest, but still the youngest part of the, uh, the microbiology. Mm -hmm. Because nobody was interested in, my, in mycology. You didn't die about myco uh, on, on, on fungi. No, because but there are so many mushrooms, right? Or, yes. Yeah. And there's a lot of... Uh, but in the, in the ancient times, I th 50 years ago, it's ancient. Yeah. You died about a bacteria. Yeah. Uh, and, until we had penicillin, and that's becoming from penicillium. Uh, it's also a mold. And now... After that, nobody dies. A lot of people die about <laughs> bacteria, but not that much yeah. as 50 or 100 years ago. But now they're going to die about molds because they were forgotten or were in, an, in the corner or nobody looked because you didn't die about that. Okay. And now with COVID, COVID-19, yeah. a lot of people are dying not only with COVID, but also a super infection with a mold. So how come we overlooked fungi for so long? I don't think we overlooked. I think everybody was aware uh, because uh, a lot of people has uh, a kalknagel or yeah. has a swimmer's exam. And it's typical. A and mold then we infection. don't know that it's mold. Yeah. It's a mold, yes. But we don't say it's a mold. And we don't die about that. No. And one million of one... We just ignore it. Yeah. yeah. How many people do you think dies about a mold infection a year worldwide? Uh, I think 5% of the people who die. Calculate it. 1.8 <laughs> million. I don't have... Yeah, that's a lot of people. So if you're working with molds... That's worldwide. Yes. Like in, in, in every country, people yes. are dying of yeah. the, the specific oh. molds growing there. Yeah. yeah. So this, if you work, start working with molds, you have to be aware of what, what you're working with. Yeah. And that's the good reason that we are with collaborating together. Okay, and um, so uh, what are the challenges and opportunities in your collaboration with people like Emma? So I think it is always uh, a challenge, but if you, have a <laughs> if you have a coating for something, maybe you can use the coating also for... for uh, it's a challenge on the, on, on, on the, the project, right? Project, not yes, with not working not with Emma, yeah. <laughs> maybe also... <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, so, uh, no, that was really nice to work with them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you have a coating for outside of the body, why not for, for, for materials yeah. inside of the body? Because it's biological. Yeah, but and yeah, sorry, and because I'm also interested, so why, Emma, uh, if, if there are so many hazards with molds, why do you still want to work with fungi? Um, because we have good uh, preventive materials, of course, to, to work uh, with them in the lab, so we worked in uh, with, of course, the gloves, the the coats, the mouth caps, um, and in the flow hood. So that's a, a hood uh, with a glass window uh, and a constant air circulation. So you, as a person, don't infect the mold, but also vice mm -hmm. versa. So, um, but there are so many opportunities because. The fungi we worked with um, could be a potential danger for a patient that is suffering for, let's say, cancer or any other immune disease. But for a person, a healthy person yeah. like us, it's not uh, a threat, um, threatening. A, threat, yeah. a fungi and many fungi have uh, 
a natural coating. So for example, if you walk outside in the forest and it starts to rain, the raindrops will fall off yeah. the cap of the mushroom. And this quality, this is one of the qualities that a fungi has, which we, uh, let's say, integrate or used in, uh, in the, the prototype. Product, yeah. Maybe you can explain how, uh, take one of your uh, works and maybe explain us, the listeners back home, how it works. For the funky super coating? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Let's start with that one. Um, well, so uh, there was uh, the idea to coat um, the bacterial letter, Suzanne also uh, worked with uh, or introduced uh, to me, uh, to make that water repellent because that's one of the the challenges for the material and eventually also the scaling is, a, is another challenge. But I was wondering if we could create a natural coating to coat this material because people say, oh, you can use beeswax and oils and chemicals. Of course we can use that. But what is more beautiful to coat it with something natural that also benefits the material on, um, for example, um, or improves the material even more with a coating like this, not only to make it water repellent. Um, so that's why I propose to participate in this award and eventually we won 25,000 euros to develop wow. this. Wow. So it's actually not a lot of money to do scientific no, research. No, so <laughs> other people saw the potential as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was a very commercial project which, yeah. which we proposed. Um, and yeah, we started to work at the Radboud and uh, together with the professors and, and Hein, we, they made a selection of potential fungi that yeah. could accept this material, the, the bacterial letter, which also contains bacteria and yeast, mm -hmm. because sometimes they start to fight. Yeah. <laughs> so it was literally a, a, a matchmaking, a dating session between um, that material and, and, and the between fungi. between you two, yeah. Yeah, as well, yeah. Um, and of course, uh, um, also for the the story, uh, because this fungi that we used and another one, uh, or especially one of them, uh, could be a danger, like I just said. Mm -hmm. But also the other side of the story is that this fungi has great potentials to become a water repellent coating. Yeah, in a and natural way. Right? Yeah, of yeah. course, uh, there's natural, a yeah. lot of things that need to yeah. happen to eventually make this scalable. Yeah. How was it for you? Because we, uh, um, how was it? Why are scientists important for you and in your line of work? Well, I think scientists possess so much knowledge, of course, and uh, designers as well from their own perspectives. Perspective, but we can't be everything. We, we are not a superhero. Well, yeah. some of some of. There are designers and scientists who are superheroes, of course, but um, if you start to collaborate, you learn from each other, you develop a, a language together and use each other's qualities to create a very beautiful product. Mm -hmm. And um, there are so many treasures in laboratories that are still behind doors because people don't see what it could mean or be yeah. in our world. And... I think that designers could show the potential of scientific, scientific breakthroughs um, uh, by taking that uh, scientific knowledge out of the lab and start to work together. That's actually beautiful. So Emma, why is it important for you to work with scientists like Hein? Well, scientists possess a lot of knowledge and knowledge I need uh, as a designer to move forward, especially if I want to develop something like a material or this coating. And... Um, the only reason to access a university or, or a hospital for scientific research if, is if you have money, mm -hmm. which is uh, really hard. So that's why, for example, Blue City Lab can be uh, the first step to develop something and then uh, start to look for funding and then try to collaborate. That That's one. Uh, so, for example, co the coincidence of... Um, finding something that has a lot of potential is not there anymore. Hein also told us that. So, uh, for example, a prize like the Bio Art and Design Award is a great uh, opportunity to start working with uh, universities. And I think there are so many scientific breakthroughs that are still behind doors because nobody showed the potential of it in a, a feasible product. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think it's also very important for investors to see what you can do with a certain scientific technology 
to invest in it, to accelerate the, the, the new economy uh, yeah. more and more. And of course, Hein is working more on a medical field, but I think in the medical field, we there there are also a lot of, even now with the COVID pandemic, we need, um, you know, it would be great if we have those uh, completely compostable mouth caps made out of uh, yeah. fungi or whatever, also pre preventive material for, for hospitals. Yeah. Um, so in every industry, uh, we need we need to bring science, design, and technology together. Um, so yeah, that's why I think. <laughs> <laughs> and what's needed to to move forward uh, in this field of biodesign? I think, um, of course, there is a whole transition period where we are in now, and I think a lot of is, storytelling is a really big aspect of it mm -hmm. to show people the potential and not that. Fungi or bacteria, for example, are are dangerous, but also because <laughs> people sometimes don't even know that their beer was brewed with a bunch of yeast. Yeah. Um, so I think storytelling is is really important and say, hey, this is what we can do. Yeah. Uh, and we have more examples this week where people show the, the beauty of biodesign, and literally for every industry, um, we can create something. Yeah. But of course, we need to have the will, the facilities, the money. Um, and the pioneers working on yeah. this, and, and the education, not to forget. So how can we move forward to this amazing idea to implement implementation and really build this new economy we were just talking about, from both of your perspectives? So there is already one coating uh, for, for fences and houses, mm -hmm. and they use it in, uh, in Sweden, and it's, um, it's an oil, and the oil is um, not contaminated with uh, a yeast, but contains a yeast. Yeah. And it gives a natural defense for, for other kind of fungi aff affecting the wood or the, the houses. So the houses are be painted with the, with the yeast. They become black. Okay. Really, really, really nice. It's like the old uh, carboleum that's uh, oil-based, which people used back in the days to make their house black. And now we can just use... A fungi. Yes. I think it's actually a Dutch company. Xylo, yes, it's a Dutch company. Finish, yes. 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 Auro Basidium. Yeah, the Auro Aureo Basidium. It's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful a, name. <laughs> it's a beautiful name. All the molds have beautiful names. And and and, and from your perspective, um, because it, yeah, like it, the because you know you work with so many bio designers as well. What's really necessary to go from project from great idea to implementation? Like what Suzanne Lee is now doing, like uh, and also to scale up. Yeah, scale up is of course. Well, one thing is facility. Um, yeah. Uh, and also start communities where people um, join forces together to accelerate uh, the new economy, so to say. Um, so, so that's a really important thing. But also, yeah, investment. So the dare uh, for companies to invest in these technologies and help them scale the technology because there is a lot of a lot of possible. Yeah. Uh, for example, at the DSM facility uh, close by, they are uh, re um, reusing old uh, scientific installations uh, that used to be um, working for the oil industry now to. Uh, um, analyze biological content mm -hmm. or biomass for uh, this bio economy and that's a beautiful thing so we can reuse and uh, old installations but we have to do that and believe in it as well yeah so there is a lot a lot to gain there is already a lot of i think especially in the netherlands we have a lot of companies designers institutes universities that are really willing and uh, working on on the the new economy. How do you foresee the future of biodesign in your work? Biological scene. Um, I think design, biodesign, is something else. Sometimes in the medical way than in the, in, in, in the artist way. So, like, um, if you really say biodesigning, you have to think about creating an ear or these kind of thing of cartridge. Yeah, so they are doing a 3D printer. You can make already a new ear. And wow! You, you put it under under the skin of a patient. I saw that with rats. Yes, but also by patients now they have already, and they can make everything by 3D 
3D <laughs> three, printer. Three D printer. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it's coming not not from the university. I think it's by designers at yeah, the first time, and they they make houses or something else, and and now they're making new organs. They're making everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you are using cells or building scaffolds yes. in the lab from biological origin, and here in the lab we we are using now a PLA, but uh, we can we can print. Uh, yeah, the basic for, for organisms to grow scaffolds like this. And that's really mm. amazing. You're talking about now, but how do you see the future? I think the future is more, si uh, more like Star Trek. Yeah. You're going to see people with uh, bio biomechanical arms and uh, other kind of things. So and then you have to have transplantation of everything so so biological mechanical and design so it's like the human cyborg i think it's so. like the terminator yeah no i think cyborg is, is is better and i think maybe 10 years we have a hard disk yeah. on our back and can i ask because this costs a lot of money to realize this so that was my other question about the implementation as well because you need to scale it up to make it profitable that's how this so we all want to live in this circular economy but we are living in this linear economy so how is this circular I, th I don't know I really don't know if that's in, in medical it's, it's okay it's this new economy yeah, so but then still it, it costs a lot of money it's to really costly this. yes yeah. yes if you have the exoskeleton yeah. For a human being, I think it's 100,000 euros. Yeah. So and that's the starter. Uh, and it's the start. And it comes from military knowledge. Yes. Because they have the money. Yeah. So, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you see the future? And also listening to Hein. Yeah, I think um, tissue engineering, what Hein was talking yeah. about, is really interesting because, like, I said we can also use this technology to grow meat in labs, uh, skin yeah. in labs, leather, leathers. Um, so the technology is there, but again, uh, the investment is is uh, also in the medical field uh, a really big challenge. Yeah. But if we look back now to, from this point, yeah. 2020, 10 years ago, uh, what already has happened in the field is huge. Uh, and if we, I really sound like Trump now. <laughs> <laughs> Great, it's, it's huge. It's yeah. huge. Uh, <laughs> but if we uh, take a look at 2030, uh, of course, there is a really big challenge um, facing all the sustainability uh, problems. Yeah. But these technologies can also uh, exclude uh, a lot of things in a positive way. So, for example, using CO2 uh, in processes, to yeah. in fermentation uh, processes. So, so we need to look back and with the knowledge we already gained, see how yeah. we can combine it with the technology of now and beyond to stay in the stars track vibes of yeah that. because if you read <laughs> science fiction books yeah um to name a few uh aldous huxley for example is uh what they are talking about back then is happening right, right now. now so i think nowadays science fiction will be real reality in 50 years yeah and also the other aspect in science fiction is also the role of nature it plays a very big important part Yes. Nature always plays an important part in science fiction as well. Yes, I, uh, yeah, not, yeah, nature uh, here on Earth, but also on other planets, I yeah. think, yeah. But what you see 10, 15 years ago was science fiction for now, it's now fiction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think we are, with the knowledge we have, we are improving very, very fast. But yeah. I think now, if you want to go further, you need a lot of money. So do you have, uh, as a closure, like a tip or maybe... Insight. Yeah, or insight that you want to share to the people listening who are maybe aspiring designers or engineers or scientists. Other mycologists. Entrepreneurs even. Don't be afraid of the new. I'm um, actually, because we always uh, end with a, 
tip or uh, like an advice, but you already like you started this this Blue City Lab, which is like the gift you gave to these young aspiring designers and scientists who want to experiment here in the basement of um, Blue City. But um, so of course we are all going to follow you. But what are your next steps or going to be your next steps? Um, well, the next steps, uh, I hope for Blue City Lab, if, if I can mention that. Yes. Um, and of course, Blue City Lab is uh, also built with a lot of more, more people. Um, so uh, thanks for that. But we, yeah, we're now finishing off the, the second uh, construction period. Um, so I really, truly hope that a lot of people want to come and see uh the beautiful lab, but also partners, uh, because we have a lot of creativity here and a lot of brains um, and creativity that might change your company um, by evolving, uh, evolving designers. Uh, so, yeah, please all come and join the community. That's something I really hope and, and wish for. Um, that's what I need for the lab. Yeah. Um, and for myself. Yeah, the coating was, of course, a prototype. Um, and it's now currently uh, still in the Floriade Pavilion, in the Growing Pavilion, exhibited. So I'm really mm -hmm. curious what people think about it. Uh, and of course, it is a prototype, so it's not there yet. Um, but we are continuing uh, the idea of the coating, but then combined with packaging. Yeah. We're still waiting for... Uh, um, a go on this project because it's been yeah. with more partners so that's uh, still a bit uncertain and is it commercial partners as well uh yes so i can't yeah. say uh, <laughs> no but all about it but um that's that's one uh, really one hope yeah and it's also a difficult choice because i'm a designer and don't know if i want to start a whole new company around this coating because that's a uh, yeah something i need to decide yeah uh, what my role in this project is. That's a, that's also a very interesting topic to talk about <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe next uh, podcast series. Yeah. Yeah, but I uh, what I also often tell or say in my presentations is that I really see the harbor of Rotterdam changing, and that my future hope is that they want to start talking with pioneers, pioneers, and pioneers here from Blue City Lab to see the value of, uh, but I really hope uh, that for example, the Harbor of Rotterdam and the Municipality of Rotterdam take a look at these at the, the work of these pioneers and pioneers in the city to eventually maybe change the role of the harbor, not, um, um, well, from an oil-based uh, yeah. um, perspective to a bio-based perspective and that we can reuse these installations to eventually ferment our foods, our materials, our fuels. And that is really a wish, a dream, but also a goal. So, um, so Port of Rotterdam, call Emma. Please call. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> or Blue City, yeah. of course. So, hi, and Emma, thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you, Emma, for this kickoff. And in the next podcast, you'll be luckily sitting next to me again and we'll yes. be co hosting and interviewing. Much more comfortable position. <laughs> <laughs> I so, believe uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> thanks again. <laughs> thanks again. Thanks, Hein. Good luck. This Growcast was hosted by Barbara Vos and Emma van der Leest and produced by Blue City Lab. This podcast was realized with funding from the Municipality of Rotterdam and Creative Industries Fund NL and was edited by Puree Productions. We also want to give a shout out to Nienke Binnendijk, director of Blue City Lab, and Sabine Biesheuvel, director of Blue City, and actually everyone else from the Blue City team for their trust and never-ending support. Until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>